Welcome to Vineyard Hopkinton. As we follow Jesus together, we experience the Holy Spirit, create a multicultural community, and pursue kingdom of God justice. Well, my name is Stephen, if I didn't already say that. Uh, And uh, I'm going to talk about prayer today. And so I was thinking about like when my prayer life really took off. And I think it was seventh grade. I got exact with it. I think it was seventh grade. In fact, I think it was the first day of seventh grade. I was going to a new school, which always increases your prayer life as a seventh grader. Uh, First day uh, at a new school, it was like second or third period. I don't remember exactly which period of the day that it was. Uh, I remember it was English, English class, and I remember the name of the teacher. That's how much she scarred me. No, <laughs> but I do remember her name. I won't, I won't give her a shout out right now, but uh, seventh grade English class, and I'm sitting there first day at a new school. I was pretty nervous, uh, as one always is during those times, and sitting there, my last name's Watson, so I'm always towards the end of the alphabet anytime that they do roll call, you know, to get to know all the students. Uh, so I'm sitting there waiting for them to get to my name, and the teacher goes, Stephanie. And I look around, and I'm like, I don't see any Stephanies. Maybe they were sick on the first day of school. That's rare. And then she looks at it again and she goes, oh, Stephanie Watson. (laughs) And whatever age I was in seventh grade, 13 or something, 13-year-old me all of a sudden realized that my name just got mispronounced. Now, my name is Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N. Like, she's an English teacher. She should be able to figure that out. Like, this should not be hard. But (laughs) she did not know how to pronounce it. And she repeats it again, Stephanie Watson. And so I sit there, first day of school, new school. My face keeps getting redder and redder. I'm sure if there was a movie made about this, my voice would crack at this point. I don't know if it did. But I was like, um, that's me, but, but my name, and I couldn't get it out fast enough. Everybody starts laughing in the class. Like, my name's Steven, and it was all over. And that English teacher did what teachers always thought was funny. So my first name's John. It's like in parentheses on the list, you know, because I don't go by John. And so she looks at it again. She's like, oh, Dr. Watson, I presume. <laughs> and makes that Sherlock Holmes joke that I have heard a million times in my life. Like, it's not as funny as you think that it is. <laughs> and so at that moment, seventh grade, English class, all of a sudden I started to pray real hard because I still had like five other classes to get through where there was a chance that they were going to butcher my name. And let me tell you that this continued all the way through college. Teachers of all ages do not know how to read. It is a pandemic that we have. Like it's an issue. And I have been the recipient over and over and over again. Uh, But I don't want you to think that I only pray one day a year in middle school. Like, I prayed a lot. I prayed every time I walked by certain tables in the cafeteria. I prayed every time I went to French class because I was truly terrible at that class and did not know what I was saying when I would say words. Like, I I prayed uh, for invisibility, which Jesus never gave me. But at times that I realized that there was something wrong with the clothes that I was wearing, like when I left my fly down in eighth grade in the cafeteria, like, you know, like I prayed a lot because it was painful. Uh, I I think I was living out what the Bible tells you to to do, you know, 1 Thessalonians, never stop praying for this is God's will. So God gave me all these opportunities to pray all the time over and over and over again. Little tongue in cheek there, but God does actually want us to pray all the time. He wants us to communicate with him all the time. That's essentially what prayer is. It's having a conversation between you and God that's constant and that's going uh, at all times in your life. But my prayers as a teenager were dictated, as you would expect, by a sense of urgency and anxiety. That's what led me to pray all the time. What dictates your prayer life? What guides your prayers? What pushes you to a place of praying? You may be sitting there and you're like, oh, you already said it, Stephen. It's urgency. Like when things happen, that's when I start to pray. And that's, that's fair. Sometimes the best prayer that you can say is a simple like, 
Jesus help, like God help. I need something right now. I need you to come and to move in this situation. Sometimes that's the best prayer. And there's something good about that, about acknowledging our needs to God and saying like at the same time, like I actually believe that you can do something. I actually think you can move in this. That's why I'm saying God help because I trust that you're good enough to come and to move in my life in this way. In 2014, uh, David Knott, he was a British surgeon and he was interviewed on the BBC and he said that I'm not religious, but every now and then I pray to God and I ask him to help me because I'm suffering badly. It's only now and again that I am able to talk to him and there's not a doubt in my mind that there is a God. There was an artist by the name of Patrick Brill who heard that interview and he spent the next four months in his studio on a huge canvas, writing and rewriting these words over and over and over again. He was so captivated by what this guy said in this interview, he called it an interview with David Knott, like that's pretty on the nose, but he repeated it over and over and over again what this man said in this interview. And it actually became, uh, this picture here was the centerpiece of his summer exhibit in London's Royal Academy. And so millions of people came to see this uh, dialogue about prayer and other things that David not had. And I think of Patrick Brill spending months staring at that canvas, rewriting the same words over and over and over again, And I wonder if he ever started to ask the question that I've asked and that maybe some of you have also asked, that can prayer ever be more than help me please? How does it go beyond that step? How does prayer become the foundation for our relationship with God versus just a shout out for help when life seems unlivable? How do we take that next step in our communication with Jesus? We're in a series called Who Would Jesus Be? And we're looking at the life of Jesus, at the patterns that Jesus had, at the character of Jesus. And when I think about who Jesus was, I immediately start to think about prayer because the guy was always going off by himself to talk to his father. It's scattered throughout the gospels. This is what he did. This is how he lived his life. I'm not actually sure that Jesus ever commanded us to pray. He just did it all the time. He just was constantly doing it in such a way that it grabbed a hold of all of his followers and did something within them. We see verses like Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer, repeated over and over this like casual and almost like throwaway comments about what Jesus went to go do. And we see it repeated all the time throughout the Gospels. It was obviously vital to how he lived his life. Eugene Peterson said that prayer is the language of the Trinity. So when we pray, we embrace the language of Jesus as our language. This morning, I'm excited to take time to embrace the language of Jesus as our language, to be transformed by this practice that was so vital to how Jesus lived his life so that we can be transformed to live our lives in ways that look more like Jesus. So let's pray, and then we're going to continue on. And I want to read uh, Psalm 34 as a prayer uh, as we start off today. So let's pray. I will extol the Lord at all times. His prayer will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all of my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. 
Jesus, we just ask that you will come and reorient our hearts towards you. Let us just encounter you today in ways that leave us radically transformed by being in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus had lots of practices around prayer, pretty simple practices though, and I want to talk about the practices and beliefs that we see in the Gospels. It's looking mostly at the Gospel of Luke. In the Gospel of Luke, it's repeated 11 times that Jesus was either praying or that he was teaching on prayer. It's one of the most common themes throughout the entire Gospel on Jesus' patterns of prayer. In the Gospels, in case you didn't realize, they were written as firsthand accounts from people who lived with Jesus, who did life with him, who heard his teachings, who were aware of what it was that he did and how it was that he lived. The Gospel of Luke, which I think this is kind of fun, uh, when you think of how he got his stories, it's thought that the two main sources for the Gospel of Luke, the two people he talked to to learn about Jesus the most from, one was Peter, one of the original uh, disciples, one of Jesus' three closest friends who was with him from the very beginning of his ministry. And the second is Mary, his mother. That's why there's more stories about the birth and what happened before Jesus was born in the Gospel of Luke than there are in any of the other Gospels. So if I was to ask your best friend and your mom how you lived your life, what you did with your life, uh, what you were like growing up in the early days, what kind of guided you, what principles guided you, I bet we would get a pretty good picture of who you are and what you're up to. So when we see the Gospel of Luke, it's pretty obvious that prayer was super vital to how Jesus lived his life. It was something that stuck with the people who did life with him. Again, Luke 5, 16, Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. Prayer was a habit that Jesus had, not a chore. It was something he wanted to do, that he found great joy in. Uh, For Jesus and others with vibrant practices of prayer, the frequency of prayer is always based on a confidence in who God is and a desire to be in God's presence. Those things always guide how often we're praying because prayer is relational. So if you think about people that you like being around, if you're married, hopefully your spouse is one of those people, Hopefully you have a few friends that you would consider in that category, maybe some family members uh, that you enjoy spending time with. I can guarantee three things about those relationships. The first thing is that you have confidence in who they are and what they think about you. The second thing is that you have no problem finding time to spend with them. And the third thing is that your relationship grows stronger as you spend more time together. Those are guaranteed things with people who bring life to you, relationships that you value, that you want to be with. So apply that to your relationship with God. Do you see those things showing up in your relationship with God, in your prayer time with God? In order to be a person who prays often, you have to be confident in who God is. Without a built-up expectation of God's goodness, you're going to struggle to want to spend time talking with him because you're not going to know if you actually believe that he wants to spend time with you. That has to be there. John White wrote a book about prayer, and he said, we cannot pray fervently without faith and hope. If we approach a door expecting that no one will be home or fearing that whoever is home will receive us coldly, we may not knock more than once. But if we've been received with frequent kindness, we will have faith to knock hard a second time. Think about that. Jesus knew that he was going to be received with kindness by his father. So he had never had an issue knocking and going back and going back and going back. And this led to the second thing that I noticed about Jesus' prayer life, that he made the presence of God his safe place. Look at Luke 9, 18. It says, one day Jesus left the crowds to pray alone. At this point, 
Right before this, Jesus had just done a ton of things that would have wiped us all out. Huge sermons in front of thousands of people, miracles that were crazy. Like he was exhausted, he was empty. And so where did he go in that time when he was exhausted, when he was empty, when he needed to be refilled, when he needed to get away? He went to pray. Why? Because he knew that he would be restored, made whole, renewed in the presence of his father. He had experienced the kindness of his father, and he knew it was the only place that he could go to. This was his lived out actual experience. It wasn't theory or hypotheticals. It wasn't just hoped for, but it was actually his like lived out truth. He had experienced it so many times that he was confident in it, that that's what was going to happen when he would go away to pray. John White, again, he says, prayer deals with realities. A real God that can hear. A historical triumph on the cross witnessed by an empty tomb. A living high priest who pleads before the throne of God. True miracles that the Holy Spirit has already brought to pass in the lives of people we pray for. A Holy Spirit who is present working in our hearts. If you fix your mind on realities, the shadows will fade away because God is straining to hear what you say. If you want to live a life like Jesus, you need to ground yourself in truth. Truth like God is good, that he's always moving, that he wants to speak to you, that his presence is the place where you're restored, renewed, and you're made whole. That he's going to answer the door with kindness when you come and ask for him to come. And so it was out of these habit-forming practices and beliefs that Jesus then taught his disciples how to pray. And I love this encounter uh, because it shows so much about the disciples at this point in Luke chapter 11. It says, once Jesus was in a certain place praying, and as he finished, one of the disciples came to him and he said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Essentially, Jesus's practice of prayer was so attractive that his followers were like, okay, I'm tired of waiting. Jesus, just tell me how it is that I'm supposed to do this. I want my prayer time to look like yours, not like how it is for me right now. Please just tell me the secret sauce. What is it? Teach me what you're doing. And Jesus lays it out in front of them in the rest of this. And I admire the disciples for doing this. This shows like a real depth uh, of, of spiritual desire on their part to go to Jesus and say, like, I'm tired of waiting on you. You need to give me what it is that I need to be able to do this well. I sometimes forget to take this step. I had an instance uh, recently. I was meeting with my spiritual director, and we, I had brought up an issue that I wanted to work through. And we went into full like combat mode and we were diagnosing and discerning and like figuring everything out and it was good. And then he gets this sheepish smile on his face. And he was like, Stephen, I'm kind of embarrassed to ask this at this point because we've been talking for a while. Did you pray about this? And we both smiled at each other in the way that two Christian professionals uh, would and <laughs> realized, shoot, we forgot the most essential element in this entire thing. And we paused and we were like, okay, Jesus, what are you saying to us in this? And we prayed. Jesus, teach us how to pray. Eugene Peterson said that it's a common practice in the Christian community to apprentice ourselves to the prayers that Jesus prayed. We keep conversational company with Jesus as he prays. We get used to the ways that he prays so that we can become honest in our needs, attentive to the presence of God, and responsive to the Spirit. We apprentice ourselves to the prayers that Jesus prayed. Do you want to be apprenticed by Jesus' prayers? It sounds like a pretty good thing to orient our lives around. So I actually want to do this. I want to go and we're going to pray through the Lord's Prayer, what followed this request. We're going to read it line by line, pray through it, and then I'm going to give some pauses in between for you and your heart to pray and to give to Jesus whatever each line is bringing up for you. Make it personal. Uh, and let's allow this prayer of Jesus to sink in and to kind of guide us 
this morning. So if you'll pray with me. It starts in Luke 11, 1. Again, I'll read this. It says, Once Jesus was in a certain place praying, and as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And Jesus said, This is how you should pray. So say this with me. Father, may your name be kept holy. I'm just going to pause and just encourage you to just call Jesus, call the Father by whatever name is personal to you today. Who do you know him to be this morning? May your kingdom come soon. Just in your hearts, ask God to come and to move in the ways that you're longing for him to come and to move. Give us each day the food that we need. Just let him know what it is that you're needing this morning. Get personal, get practical. And forgive us our sins. And just start naming in your heart the things that you need forgiveness for. As we forgive those who sin against us. Just name anyone that you need to forgive. Don't let us yield to temptation and deliver us from evil. Just ask God for protection. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. We do just declare that you are God, that you are good, that you're active, that you're moving. I pray for all the things that we've just laid before you, the ways that we've made this personal, that you will come just like it says in the Bible that you just make it a sacrifice and offering to you that reaches your throne and that you'll come and fill us with your presence, with your spirit, with your joy, with your love, with your peace right here and right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let us be apprenticed by Jesus in how we pray. You know, prayer has an obvious internal aspect. What we just did is all internal, right? Me and Jesus. But there's also an obvious external aspect if you read the Gospels when it comes to prayer. Being apprenticed by Jesus means that you're going to be praying for other people. That's a part of what he sends people to do. Luke 10, 1, Jesus chose 72 disciples. He sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns in places that he planned to visit. In verse 8, he says, if you enter a town and it welcomes you, eat whatever is set before you, heal the sick, and tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. When the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. We learn from Jesus what it looks like to have habits of prayer, and then we're sent to go and to do likewise, to do the same things that he does to those around us, to bring the kingdom into the places that we're being sent with an expectation that the kingdom of God is going to come that Jesus is actually going to do something. Uh, the disciples went with an, they may, may have went with a fearful expectation at that point because they weren't quite sure what was gonna happen, but they came back with a solid expectation and lived out reality that they knew that he was going to move when they invited him to come and to move into their world. 
And every Sunday, we try and create space for this, where we uh, invite people to come up and to receive prayer. And often I'll say something like, if you're a part of our church, if you've been here for a while, you are authorized to go and to pray for somebody else. Like if you're a follower of Jesus, go and pray for those around you. And I realize that some of you may look at me when I say that and you're like, I don't know what to do right now. I don't know what to do with my hands. No, that's a movie reference. Uh, but like, I don't know what to do with myself right now. So I wanted to just kind of model it out for you if that's okay. So Dave, sound guy, I'm pulling the sound guy off of his, off of his job because I asked him if I could pray for him. Uh, to just show you what it looks like to pray for somebody uh, in kind of a normalized way. And the first, I just want to say three things. Grab a seat there. Yes, sir. There you go. Thank you. Three things to remember about somebody like Dave when you're praying for them. The first is that God wants to give good gifts. If you look at Luke 11, Jesus says, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Let your prayers for somebody grow out of a confidence that God wants to give a good gift. God wants to bless Dave. That's a guarantee. We don't have to question whether or not that's true. It's truth. Like Jesus said it. The second thing we need to remember is the person that you're praying for matters to Jesus. They're precious to Jesus. He died for them. He loves them. He wants to show up and to act in their lives. You don't have to wonder if he's going to do something. Uh, if he loves the person there, just show them that he does. That's something that you can be confident in. And the third thing is that the person that you're praying for, when you're praying for somebody, they need to know that Jesus loves them today and what's going on in their life today. I don't care if, it's, if you've never met Jesus, if you've been following Jesus for a year, or how many years have you been following Jesus? No. 40. 40 years. Do you need to know today that Jesus loves you in this certain specific situation you're in today? Yes. yes. That's true for everybody. Be confident in these things. God gives good gifts. He loves the person that you're praying for, and he wants to show them his love in practical ways. Uh, so be confident in those things. Kids are praying, teens are praying, everybody's praying. Like, this is what the church is. We are a group of people who are apprenticed by Jesus to live out what it is that he's called us to do, to bring his kingdom in our world, one step at a time, following his lead. Amen.